So welcome to tonight's uh, distinguished lecture, ladies and gentlemen, which is going to be delivered by Deborah Baker, about whom I'll, I'll say something in just a moment. The title, of course, well, the title of the talk is not there, um, although the talk is about that book, A Parable of Islam in the West, Margaret Marcus and Maulana Maududi, which is the story of, of the writing of The Convert, A Tale of Exile and Extremism. Um, So let me read a short blurb, The Origins of the Convert, a Singular Odyssey into the liber Labyrinthine Heart of 20th Century Political Islam, lie in a cache of letters by a convert named Mariam Jamila, one of the most trenchant and celebrated voices of Islam's argument with the West. The letters raise the question, what drives a young woman raised in, in a New York City suburb to convert to Islam, abandon country, family, and faith, and move to Pakistan? Casting a shadow over these letters is Maulana al maududi both uh, her adoptive father and mentor, and a man who laid the foundations for militant Islam. This lecture recounts the challenge of writing this book, which uh, was also a finalist for the, the National Book Award in nonfiction during the early years of the American War on Terror. Um, so that is the, the subject of tonight's lecture, which I'm looking forward to greatly. Um, but a word about uh, our speaker, Deborah Baker, who was born in Charlottesville and grew up in Virginia, Puerto Rico, and New England. And there's a nice photo of her riding a horse on the website. Can I imagine that's in Virginia? Uh, she attended the University of Virginia and Cambridge University. Um, her first biography, bio biography, excuse me, written in college was Making a Farm, The Life of Robert Bly, published by Beacon Press in 1982. After working a number of years as a book editor and, and publisher, in 1990 she moved to Calcutta, where she wrote In Extremis, um, The Life of Laura Riding. So there seems to be a extremes in common in running through your work, uh, a, a minor observation. Uh, this was published by Grove Press and Hamish Hamilton in the UK, and it was shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize in Biography in 1994. Her third book, A Blue Hand, The Beats in India, was published by Penguin and Penguin, Penguin USA and Penguin India in 2008. In 2008 to nine, she was a fellow of the, at the Dorothy and Lewis C. Coleman Center for Writers and Scholars at the New, New York Public Library. And there she researched and wrote the, the Convert, A Tale of Exile and Extremism, drawn on letters on deposit in the library's manuscript division. The Convert was a finalist for the 2011 National Book Award in nonfiction, as I've said. Now, it's received many accolades, uh, none more perhaps encapsulating of the, of the spirit of those accolades than the one that I uh, found in, in the New York Times book reviewed. Baker's captivating account conveys the instability, faith, politics, and improbable cultural migration that makes Mariam Jamila's life story so difficult to sum up, yet impossible to dismiss. Welcome, Deborah Baker. Um, before I start, I would just like to thank um, the people that helped to work to make, to bring me here along with my husband and have looked after us while we've been here and helped arrange this evening. Um, Brian, Judy, Niels, Philip, Nahed. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, Omar in the back translating into Arabic. I'll try and speak slowly and clearly <laughs> for his sake and for yours. Anyways, I'd like to stalk, start my talk by reading a portion of a very long letter that I found in an archive in the New York Public Library in 2007. The letter was written in 1962, and it was by a young woman newly arrived in Lahore, Pakistan. It was addressed to her parents back in America. Your exhaustive description of mother's birthday dinner at that fancy Westchester restaurant was well nigh unbearable to read. I'm still unaccustomed to the Pakistani diet and to hear of the rich menu of foods you are enjoying is a torment. When I am most hungry, I have visions of steak and pot roast and meatloaf and mashed potatoes finished off with a thick slice of Sara Lee cheesecake and ice cream. The Maulana confided to me that he experienced similar visions of Begum Maududi's 
dishes when he was fated in the tents of Saudi Arabia. On his yearly visit, he is expected to relish the sight of an entire roast camel. The hump is served as an appetizer, and as the honored guest of King Saud, he is presented the platter of testicles and eyeballs. I expect I will soon grow used to the chilies here and will find food tasteless without them. But until then, I dream of Sara Lee. The Molana is not long out of prison. On first meeting him, I could scarcely believe he was only 61 years old. His white beard, lined face, and stiff movements made him seem ancient. Jail took such a toll on his health that he has enough medicines to stock an entire dispensary. I was told by one of his associates that in an effort to make him confess, he was beaten and tortured. But even the threat of execution did not budge him from his principles. Yet despite his ill health, the Molana is a tireless political leader. He is a bitter enemy of President Ayub Khan and the Western intelligentsia, precisely because he is one of the most important Muslim thinkers in the entire world, and the message of his teaching is the exact opposite of what they represent. From five o'clock in the morning until nearly midnight, midnight, about two dozen bearded brown men in white pajamas visit the Moilana study. There, they carry on grave conversations about the work of his political party, the Jamaat Islami, which has been banned by the government because they are seeking to make Pakistan a fully fledged Islamic state with the Quran as the law of the land. During the day, the Jamaat leaders sit in the back garden and wrapped in the Maulana's discourses. And when the Muezzin calls, they form their own congregation with the Maulana as Imam, leading them in prayer. My father's family, as my favorite of Maududi's children, always jokes. It is only now, after I've been in this household for several weeks, that I have met the last of the nine Maududi children. 17-year-old Hussein Farouk has been spending part of his summer holiday with his uncle in Karachi. He returned home with suitcases bursting with up-to-the-minute Western fashions, including pointy shoes, cartons of American cigarettes, and girly magazines. Apparently, this uncle, one more of Begum Moldudi's numerous Westernized brothers, was a Muslim in name only. In America, Hussein would immediately be recognized as a juvenile delinquent. And naturally, I'm much concerned about the poor example he is setting for the rest of the boys, most particularly my dear Haider. My one real complaint is that Molana has no time to spare for me. And even when he does, his English isn't nearly as fluent as his letters had led me to believe. Left on my own, I have returned to my writing and study of Urdu. I am now writing a weekly column for the Friday Islamic Supplement of the Pakistan Daily Times. I also have ideas for a revised edition of Islam versus the West. Naturally, I wish to discuss all these thoughts with the Maulana, and when his duties do not permit this, it is frustrating. In the meantime, I decided to introduce myself to my new country by writing an autobiographical essay for the Pakistan Times, revisiting my journey from America to Pakistan. No sooner was this published than I began receiving an avalanche of marriage proposals. The Maulana had predicted this in one of his letters to me. He wrote that all those qualities that would make me a good Muslim wife would be considered faults in America, and that if I stayed in New York, I couldn't possibly hope to find a husband to be my true life companion. He said he knew a great number of virtuous young Muslims and imagined a match that would prove to be of great help to his movement. Once I arrived in Pakistan, he promised, I would have no cause to worry about my future. By far, most of these marriage proposals were addressed to the Maulana as he is my guardian. But once in a while, there would be a letter addressed to me. I am a lonely tree, lonely tree parched in the wilderness of the desert, one suitor proclaimed. A fire for you is burning in the furnace of my chest. He went on to reassure me that he had nearly 8,000 rupees in his bank account. After we received 50 such proposals, the Malana informed me that I was now the most sought after spinster in all of Pakistan. And it was, but it was hard for me to take any of these letters as seriously as the Molana did. One night over dinner, the Molana returned from taking a call in his study to inform me that I had been offered a full-time 
job teaching English at a local madrasa. I had neither interest in nor qualifications for such work, having long ago decided that I would be incapable of disciplining, disciplining a class of ill-behaved children, much less inspire in them a love of learning. But this was not what he wanted to hear. You must think of what kind of work you would like to do so that you can earn enough to live decently, he admonished me. I am old now and in poor health, and I'm very much worried about your future. Uh, when I pointed out that, that this was exactly the dilemma you both had been faced with, he interrupted me to say that my welfare was not now his concern. I would not be able to make a living from my writing because Pakistan was a poor and illiterate country. Nor can I make a living as a typist or a secretary because here only men fill those roles. If you do not want to work, he concluded, then the only alternative is marriage. I am convinced that marriage is the best thing for you, no matter how much you insist you not, do not want it. Believe me, the woman in you is not absent. She is only sleeping. So, as you've probably realized, the writer of this letter is the subject of my book, The Convert. Today I'm going to talk about her and the man she called the Malana, but also a little bit about myself and the genesis of this project. Of course, the whole point of writing biography is that you find other people's lives and creative work much more interesting than your own. But The Convert is not a conventional biography. The subtitle refers to the book as a tale of exile and extremism. This subtitle seems to suggest that what follows will be some sort of cautionary tale about the perils of being an American innocent venturing into foreign territory. In some respects, this is exactly what follows. But I have always tried to construct my biographies as narratives, as if the life in question was a work of the imagination. This is easier said than done, because of course you're not allowed to make anything up. There was an additional difficulty to confront when I was weighing whether or not to take on this story. Though the woman at the center of the convert and the man who invited her to Pakistan are legendary figures in the Islamic world, and no doubt known to many of you, they are almost entirely unknown to the general audience of American readers to whom I have dressed my previous books. And as you may imagine, it is difficult to get people to read a book about someone they have never heard of. However, one of the advantages of choosing to write about little known subjects is that these imagined book readers will have no idea of what is going to happen next. And suspense, suspense can be a tool for keeping a reader's attention. And actually, my original subtitle was A Parable of Islam in America. I like the idea of a parable. I heard an echo between the story of my convert and that of the parable of the prodigal son, in that both parables dealt with conflicts between parents and a wayward child. I thought that this approach would help me reach beyond scholars of political Islam to the ordinary reader. And a parable is the simplest kind of narrative. A parable uses simple stories to instruct the reader in good behavior and high-minded wisdom. Parables operate on a metaphorical and hortatory level rather than a purely historical one of conventional biography. I thought I could do both. Why not? Finally, I saw this book as a parable because I wanted to make sense of recent history, both the shock of the 9-11 attacks and the confusions of the war on terror that followed. I wanted to find a way to write about these subjects and to say things that were difficult to say, that were difficult even to articulate to myself without losing the sight of the fact that I was, in the final analysis, telling a story with a moral at the end, or so I hoped. So first, the convert herself. Margaret Marcus was born in 1934 and raised in a New York City suburb. She first embraced and then rejected the Zionism of her secular Jewish parents. After a difficult and somewhat prolonged adolescence, she converted at the age of 27 to Islam, and in the spring of 1962, traveled to live in Pakistan. There, writing books that were translated into many languages, 
she became widely known as the most trenchant voice of Islam's argument with the West, continually extolling the superiority of Islamic values over both secular and Judeo-Christian Western ones. She never returned to America. The life and work of Maulana Maududi is the second narrative thread of the convert. Though he was a descendant of the Prophet Muhammad, for reasons I'll come to in a moment, he also referred to himself as a convert. So already my simple parable has become a little more complicated. Born in India at the turn of the century, Abu Allah Maududi founded the Jamaat-e Islami in 1941. With the partition of the Indian subcontinent, the Jamaat-e Islami would eventually become the first Islamic political party in express opposition to the secular bearings of Jinnah's Muslim Le League. At the risk of oversimplifying the complicated transition that led up to the end of Brit British rule, and though he fervently opposed the partition of the subcontinent, Modudi's role in defining the nature of the Pakistani state has been deemed analogous to that of Gandhi's in India. Though the Jamaat-e Islami has never been very successful at the polls, Maududi's influence on the fraught history of Pakistan is both incalculable and enduring. In her very first letter to Maududi, Margaret Marcus described the trials and tribulations of her effort to live an upright life in an American society suffused by racism, promiscuity, and crass materialism. She confessed that though she had long been attracted to the teachings of Prophet Muhammad and the Arab civilization that grew out of them, she was afraid she would become a complete outcast in her family and her society if she converted. Whatever the circumstances of her upbringing, Maududi promptly replied, she had clearly always been a Muslim. Converting would just be a formality. If everyone were to be, approach Islam as she had, with an open mind and heart, the right path would be revealed to them. As for the articles she had enclosed with her first letter, he found them models of a clear and forceful mind. He invited her to come live with him in Pakistan. By asking her to live with his family in Lahore as his daughter, Maududi told her, he was acting on his belief that the bonds of faith were far more powerful than those of blood and nationhood. And not long after her correspondence with Maududi began, Margaret Marcus converted. She took the name Mariam Jamila, but she did not immediately take him up on his invitation to come live with him in Pakistan. Like Margaret, Maududi's embrace of Islam followed a dark night of the soul. After a period of youthful flirtation with Gandhi's non-cooperation movement in pre-partition India, he suffered an existential crisis that lifted only when he returned to the Quran. That a young woman raised in the West could come to hold the exact same views he had been preaching for the last 30 years simply confirmed Maududi's conviction that the truths of Islam were universal. But I knew none of this that first morning I first stumbled upon the letters I just read to you. I had never heard of Mariam Jamila or the Maulana Maududi. In the spring of 2007, I was at loose ends. Like many others, I had been following the reports of the violent insurgency in Iraq, just beginning its third year and growing ever more violent, as well as the return to, of the Taliban in Afghanistan. I had recently completed a book entitled A Blue Hand, it was the story of the American poet Allen Ginsberg's journey to India. In my research, I not only drew on those letters and diaries that Ginsberg wrote in the course of his 15-month journey, but those of his traveling companions and his correspondence back in America. I found these writings, as well as photographs, tape recordings, press clippings, in various public and private archives around the country. That is how I found myself at the archives and rare book division of the New York Public Library. And that is how I came across the archive of Mariam Jamila. The Muslim name stood out in an index of largely Jewish and Christian names. What struck me first were the similarities between the stories of Margaret Marcus and Allen Ginsberg. Margaret had arrived in Pakistan two months after Allen Ginsberg arrived in India. 
Though Alan was 10 years older, he too was raised as a secular Jew in the greater New York City area. And he too took issue with America's Cold War machinations and its lack of a sense of the sacred. He and his fellow Beats referred to themselves as Seeker and Felahin. He imagined that India would provide a path to enlightenment and he would finally understand what it was he had been set on earth to do. Margaret entertained similar expectations when she left for Lahore a year after her formal conversion. Letters and journals, photographs, and public, published work often work like talismans that can initiate a biographer into the life of one subject. It's like a make-believe game of dress-up. You take on their ideas and their attitudes as easily as you put on clothes. And there is something profoundly liberating in the prospect of looking at the world through another set of eyes, and not just any set of eyes. For a work to be meaningful, one must find a subject whose life will somehow illuminate long wondered at questions. There must be a point of sympathy. I did not immediately fall under that spell with Mariam Jamila. Yes, her books were powerful and forceful and methodical in their critique of American imperialism. And oddly precocious for a woman who had completed no more than one semester of higher education. For anyone interested in the ideological and historical underpinnings for the distrust of the West and the Islamic world, her book, Islam Versus the West, is a critical text. But the tone of the books was off-putting. My previous books had been literary biographies. I was used to a more subtle use of language, and her hectoring know-it-all tone made me cringe. Who was Margaret Markish to lecture anyone on what being a Muslim was all about? As if it were just one thing, I said to myself. She didn't even read Arabic. And wasn't it just like an American to go marching off to a foreign country and tell them what was what? But two things from her archive jumped out. The first was a, a photograph of Mariam in a full-length burqa. The majority of photographs of women in burqas that appear in the West seem to be stolen ones, pictures taken without the permission of the person being photographed. But what was different about this photograph was that Margaret, or Mariam by that time, was clearly posing for it. In fact, the photo appeared as the frontispiece of many of her books. I looked at this photograph for a long time, puzzled by the idea of having one's picture taken without showing your face. I mean, what was the point? But then it occurred to me that perhaps her self-consciousness was such that she could only be herself from beneath the burqa. And I could understand that because that is how I understood my role as a biographer. Biographers, too, display a kind of facelessness. Like me, I thought, Margaret had managed to exchange the clothes of one life for the costumes of another. She, too, was masquerading. Only for her, the life she chose wasn't an imagined one, but a real one. And for her, there was no going back. These shall be the clothes I shall wear from now on, she wrote her parents. I wish you could see me now. I wonder if you would recognize me as the same old Peggy. So the photograph was one thing. Then I turned to the first folder of Mariam's letters. There were 20 of four of them in this first folder, all addressed to Herbert and Myra Marcus, her secular Zionist parents, still living in their two-bedroom apartment in Westchester, where Peggy had spent her childhood. The first letter was dated May 1962 and was written on the Greek freighter that took her from Brooklyn to Pakistan. The last of them was written 15 months later in August of 1963. There were two bound volumes of later letters, but the 24 letters in this folder told a complete story albeit one with unexpected twists. Here was my parable. Where the voice of her books was often tendentious, the voice of these letters was completely engaging. Her lectures on Islam and secular materialism made way for the story of plucky Peggy Marcus in Pakistan, com complete with dramatic dialogue and vivid descriptions. Each letter read like a serial installment on the progress of Miss Marcus's improbable adventure. Mailed at nearly weekly intervals, they ran pages and pages long. 
Caught up in the story they had to tell, charmed by the voice I heard in them, I soon began to consider Margaret Marcus with fondness and perhaps slight condescension as Peggy, my Peggy. Why else had I been the one to stop at her name in the library catalog? In a cover note written some years later, Mariam promised future readers that considered on their own, these 24 letters would provide ample response to the following question. Why would a modern American girl seek her happiness and fulfillment in a poverty-stricken, so-called backward, third-world country? Why indeed? But for every question the letters in her books promised to answer, others arose to take their place. Some of these questions were small and niggling, but others seemed so vast I could barely grasp them. Was the enmity between Islam and the West rooted in metaphysical questions? or historical grievances? Was it ironic or inevitable that the age of liberal democracy was also the age of imperialism? Was America a Christian nation or a secular constitutional democracy? And what exactly is the relationship between the legal principles enshrined in a constitution and that country's dominant faith, a religious sect? Finally, how exactly had the American Cold War found its sequel in the War on Terror? I read great numbers of historical and theological books on such questions, but never managed to find entirely satisfactory answers. Inevitably, however, such questions drew me further and further into the archive and into the writings of Mariam Jamila and Maulana Madudi. How had Margaret, from her secular Jewish upbringing in New York City suburb, come to believe Islam held all the answers? If I approached the teachings of Muhammad with a clear and open mind, would I, as Moldudi so confidently insisted, come to the same conclusions about the moral bankruptcy of the West as the young Margaret Marcus? And so I immersed myself in the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith. It's really hard to convey the hold that all this material had on me as I shifted back and forth between the Malana, Margaret, Mariam, Muhammad, and the progress of the war on terror as I read, it, read about it in the New York Times. And whenever I felt I was getting in over my head, I returned to Peggy's story as it unfolded in the letters to her parents. But then I came to letter number 21, dated March 1963. The return address of this letter was different, as was the tone. Suddenly, Margaret was writing to her parents that her life was in danger, that she was afraid of the Molana Maludi and his henchmen. She admitted that everything she had told her parents up to this point about her life in Pakistan had not been entirely true. There were certain facts that she had withheld. Now she promised to start at the beginning and tell them what really happened on her arrival. Now she would explain how it was that she was writing to them from the Lahore madhouse. If this was a parable, this would be the point at which the moral might be drawn, where the cautionary tale trumpets its message. Of course, when I began reading her letters, I had doubts that things would turn out well for Peggy. Clearly, she had romantic, even orientalist views of Islam. So when I got to this point, I felt my suspicions were entirely justified. Beneath the story that Margaret's letters told, there had all along been another story, a shadow story, in which Herbert and Myra's deepest fears about their daughter and the man into whose care they sent her were realized. But was she truly in danger? Had she been dispatched to the madhouse because she had displeased Ms. Maldudi in, in refusing to marry? Had party elders or a jealous wife turned him against her? What happened? But her letters didn't say. Perhaps Mariam, who, who I could tell from her letters had an intractable temperament, had tried to argue some point about Islam with him. Maldudi had written that for those self-deceived people who imagined they could get him to change his views, the rightful place to accommodate them and their like is in an asylum. Maldudi also believed that women, by their very nature, posed a clear danger to the Islamic State. He traced the collapse and destruction of every great civilization to the moral decay and weakening of the social fabric that occurred when women were granted undue freedoms. 
In his view, women needed to be restrained and sequestered. Man ne men needed to be vigilant, lest they should, like Adam himself, be lured into a life of pleasure. So every narrative possibility turns on the mysteries of the human heart. In this case, the heart of Maulana Mabudi and Mariam Jamila. I could imagine any one of these scenarios as possible, but before I went any further, there was one more question I was obliged to consider, a question I invited my readers to consider. Which one did I secretly want to be true? So in the days that followed the attacks of 9-11, I waited with a friend for the phone to ring. Though we recognized the irrevocability of what had happened, I echoed her quiet certainty that there would be a phone call. But little by little, the outlines of the event became sharper, and the day finally came when we faced the fact that the husband this woman had left behind on the 88th floor had not made it out of the building. Her children asked her, why hadn't their father left with her? How had she been spared? He never imagined the towers would collapse, she told them. He stayed behind to help others find a way down. It never occurred to me that the explanation could be so simple. Didn't she ask herself, why this? Who were these men? And all the time we spent together, I could never bring myself to raise these questions. I was in awe of her composure and afraid of unsettling it. So when I began to think about the hatred that occasioned the attacks, I didn't doubt that it was real and it was frightening, but it was hard to catch hold of. The act itself was so far outside what I knew that I couldn't bear to think about it for very long. I don't think that was a mark of how much we were all suffering, but how much suffering history had spared us. So how long does it take to circle the question of what happened that day and why, to take its complete measure? 10 years? 20? In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, the meanings being worked out by Washington were incomprehensible, and I foolishly imagined beside the point. Only after I stumbled across the Majimila archive did the questions that haunted me during those days begin to smolder again. By then, of course, six years had passed, by then, the American proxy wars on the Muslim world, Mariam Jamila had so often denounced, had become cataclysmic, cataclysmic and genuine. My country now became directly responsible for the deaths of thousands upon thousands of Muslims. That is how our new enemies imagined we thought of them, not by their ethnicities or nationalities or by their family names, but by their religious beliefs. And this, a war on Muslims, had been our plan all along, they insisted, conveniently refusing to credit the stated beliefs and rationales of those behind the attacks, refusing to believe, in Pakistan most of all, that Muslims were behind the attacks. And yet, were they entirely wrong? There was reason to wonder. We hadn't gone to war against the men, man who attacked us, or even the country he came from but an easier and more profitable target, conveniently Muslim, as if all Muslim countries were now interchangeable. Had Mariam grasped something about America that I had missed? As the years wore on, the Iraqi war dead made up in numbers what they lacked in novelty, immediate impact, and intimate proximity. Yet these escalating figures, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, and probably more, rendered in simple and disposable newsprint, never seemed to register in quite the same way as the technicolor ones we had suffered. With Mariam Jamila's guidance, I felt I was considering things I had never thought of before. As with the attacks on the city, however, questions touching on the guilt or innocence of the dead were largely beside the point. Either they were all innocent and we were all guilty, or we were all innocent and they were all guilty. We now shared our enemy's faith in the power of violent spectacle, in shock and awe, in kidnappings and secret prisons. Did we take after them, or did, had they taken after us? When did this war actually begin? There were some voices that had some doubts over our leader's rationale for the war, 
But most seem to readily accept the promises of, freed of a freedom from tyranny. I imagine that my growing sense of shame and alarm echoed that felt by those family who, in the wake of the attacks, had sat thunderstruck in their homes, unable to accept that their co-religionists had been behind them. I saw, too, how long-standing legal protections ordinary Americans considered their due might simply disappear. Surveillance could become a free-for-all, and language, too, had become a game. Just how far could those we heard from in those days take words from their meanings? The Patriot Act, Homeland Security, total informational awareness, and then the memo outlining acceptable interrogation techniques titled Humane Treatment of Taliban and Al-Qaeda Detainees. It seemed that every mention of the word terror had the, word, had the power to make cowards and bigots of reasonable people. Mariam Jamila, in arguing for a return to Sharia law, asked her Muslim readers, suppose the American government decided to abandon its constitution and bill of rights and put in its place a police state so as to better defend itself. Would not sovereignty be meaningless after we lost our very reason d'etre? I began to think that something essential and something sacred in the entire project of my country had come undone. Even now, I have a hard time revisiting the questions that haunted me during those days. They are easily forgotten. One moves on. But I couldn't help but ask, how much had my trust in America be, been a cipher for a deeper and more lasting set of beliefs? How much of what I considered right and wrong was predicated on being a citizen of a well-armed country? I was exiled to myself to a state of devastation and doubt. This was my new nationality. The discovery of the archive gradually became central to understanding how all this had come about. The life of Maulana Madhudi and Mariam Jamila seemed to hold the key that would unlock the source of the suspicion enraged between our world and the world of those who attacked us. By tracing how Margaret Marcus became Mar Mariam Jamila, I imagined I could find a way out of the trap that history had set. Here there would be an explanation. Who were these 19 men? Who were we? Who was their God and who was ours? It hadn't escaped my notice that Mariam's letters also gave me the chance to peer into the window of the house of the aging leader who first issued the call for global jihad against the West, plucking his holy war from medieval obscurity and giving it a modern anti-imperialist sheen. During the 1980s, in pamphlets hawked like superhero comic books to aimless young men, Mariam Jamila too had glorified the martyrdom of legendary jihadis. I wanted to know, did Margaret live to see the attacks? What did she make of them? Did she watch the city she had known so well fall to pieces? Did that mean nothing to her? Had she changed her mind about the evils of the West, or did she remain resolute? Would she defend the indefensible? What could she tell me? I sent a letter to the address of her publisher, listed on the inside of her books. In her essay on Simone Weil, Susan Sontag wrote that there are certain eras that are too complex, too deafened by contradictory historical and intellectual experience to hear the voice of sanity. The truths we respect are those born of affliction. It wasn't that it hadn't occurred to me that Mariam's religious zeal might be the symptom of a private malady but it didn't change the possibility that she might have the kind of answers only an outsider could provide. I found in her story a secret history that would challenge those we had been telling ourselves, the wars we had been selling. The new wars, I noted, were being waged by the same flinty-eyed men whose intentions a generation before were focused elsewhere. Mariam Jamila wrote in 1969, America is allegedly determined to bestow upon Vietnam a truly free democratic society. But while buckets of crocodile tears are shed by officials in Washington over Vietnam's backwardness and miserable living standards, four million are slain. So these same men had watched that war unfold from government desks and decades later thought they could do better. Where others were inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt, the shock of this fact kept me nailed squarely in place. 
That war too was a painted as a war between freedom and tyranny. They hate our freedom, the speech writers now wrote, picking up where the earlier litany had left off. Like the young Margaret, I began to feel like a misfit. I kept a blacklist of all those commentators who had written in measured manly tones about the need for war, including writers and opinion makers I had once admired. I became shrill. Once close friends became strangers. And when casual conversation turned to the war, and only then I noted because it was going so badly, the general tone struck me as complacent or meekly despairing. Every day, I rake the news for a story that would open everyone's eyes. In 2014, it's difficult to summer, summon the fever of those years, years when even the most outrageous accounts of torture and mendacity were fleeting distractions. So eager are we to put the wars behind us. But as we see today, they are not behind us. They are here. Periodically, I would regain my composure, and remember, I wasn't always like this. But still, I wanted to know, by what rhetorical mechanism did America and the world's Muslims suddenly become each other's evil caricature? Metaphor, narrative, parable, racist propaganda? In moments of clarity, it seemed to me that whichever side of this war one was on had nothing to do with who believed in divine revelation or who had the most righteous cause nor did it have to do with who was Muslim and who was Jewish or Christian. Rather, it seemed that neither side really wanted the train of war and propaganda to stop, with the possible exception of those families actually on board, and no one knew in what direction it was headed. This was the drill on both sides. Let the drama play out, then commemorate the heroes and the martyrs. By the fall of 2007, I knew that the answers to my questions weren't all to be found in the New York Public Library, however hard I searched for them. By then, I learned that Mariam Jamila was still alive. She had replied to the letter I had sent to her publisher and invited me to visit her in Lahore. So I went to Lahore to both find out how the story of Margaret Marcus and Mariam Jamila ended and to make my way out of a seemingly insoluble impasse. Did I find what I was looking for in Pakistan? Did Margaret Marcus? Did Pakistan become the Islamic State Maulana Maududi worked all his life to achieve? Yes and no. Neither a parable nor with a simple moral nor a forensic piecing together of historical cause and effect inexorably leading to the events of 9-11. The convert plays with narrative, expectations, and cultural stereotypes, those entertained by Muslims about the West and those hawked by the West about Muslims, and hopefully the, re the ones that the reader brings to this book. Mariam cast and recast the signature events of the 20th century and her own life in a way that made the radical turn she had taken the only possible one. But she never stopped writing to her parents. She never stopped trying to explain herself to herself. This is the responsibility of any writer, to go beyond easy answers, to stretch the possibility of one's art. By portraying Mariam's struggle, both in her words and in my own, I found it possible to get beyond the argument between our respective warring worlds. Thank you. I think you did such a wonderful job in um, articulating this uh, very interesting dialectic in terms of East and West. And if, we, if one looks at the way you narrate this in such an eloquent way, it, it says a lot about you in terms of how you are, if we, we can map the ideas and, your, and the, the dialogic between you and her in terms of your expressions. What I want to find, and it probably has something to do with some of the other questions, is this, uh, because I'm trying to see her 
and I'm gonna try, I'm trying to see how we're making her more, uh, making it more intelligible, her, her, her motivations, her issues, her worldview, her perspective. So in you, in, in it, was, it seemed as though there was part of a quest as you were asking these deep questions about these existential questions uh, having to do with the West and Islam. And I wanted to find out, did you find um, the specificity of the discovery? What did you find in terms of uh, uh, your conversations, your, your interpretations, your understandings of her and her? Uh, can, can we in some way look through, can you provide a lens for us to look more deeply into what she's where she's coming from. And, and the reason this is very important to me because I'm a convert to Islam. Mm -hmm. And Miriam Jamila to the converts in America, believe it or not, well, she was like a hero to us mm -hmm. early on, mm -hmm. as well as Maududi, because we were trying to understand. And of course, coming out of the black nationalist, uh, pan-Africanist experience with anti-American sentiments. So she became a very important personality in, this, I didn't in know that. characterizing Islam mm -hmm. versus the West. So um, did you find, uh, uh, in terms of that dialectic or the dialogic, something that really made you really understand about some of her motivations for what she, how she did this? I think I did. I think I did. I mean, I think that her decision to convert to Islam and to move to Pakistan was exactly the right decision for her. Um, you know, and in that way, my feeling that, oh, that she's going to be in big trouble when she gets there, she's going to be in over her head, she doesn't know what she's getting into, blah, 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 all that stuff, that was wrong. I, I really finished this book feeling she had made the absolute right decision for herself. And she had a life. She had a life. Um, she had made a life there. She was, she was a star. Um, she had a husband. She had uh, five children. But it was a difficult life. It was a very... Um, you know, she lost her first child to um, malnutrition. Um, she found it very difficult to raise her children. But, you know, I mean, she was surrounded by a family that um, respected her. So, and I don't think she would have received the same treatment had she stayed in America, even though her parents also really loved her. But they were at a loss as to how to deal with her. Uh, and my question is, she wrote a book called Islam versus Allah Kitab, Islam versus the people of the book, who were Jews and Christians. And I wondered if in any of the correspondence, any of the, any of the archival material, you found anything related to that pro project of hers. Um, she had a very complicated relationship with Judaism. Um, I think that she was a very precocious child and, and she came of age during World War II. Um, her parents tried to hide the photographs that appeared in you know, many newspapers and magazines of the camps, the concentration camps. Um, but she found them and I think they traumatized her deeply. Um, but her feeling in having been raised as a secular Jew was that she was surrounded by Jews who weren't real Jews, who, who um, had become divorced from their sort of fellahin past. And she felt that with the founding of the state of Israel, and initially she felt like a, and this is a 14-year-old, 15-year-old construction, she felt, A, there was a wonderful thing. The Jews could re return to Palestine and learn how to become real Jews again, real Semites. And to, who would they learn that from? They would, she would, they would learn it from the pa pa Palestinians, from the Fellahim. And furthermore, they would be protected there in the same way that Jews had been protected in 12th century Spain, that they would, they would find a true refuge there. So um, that was her expectation. And, um, and there was a lot in New York going on in 1948. There was a lot of excitement about the state of Israel, about this idea of this 
of this uh, you know, promised land being created out of the desert. But when the war broke out, when she saw what was going on, um, she became deeply traumatized and radicalized at the same time. And that's really when the problems with her parents began. And I think she took that you know, tremendous disappointment um, with, she carried that with her till the end of her life, that disappointment. At, by the same token, she knew that it was Muslims that attacked the World Trade Center, which is not something that her husband and his, 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 her sons and daughters-in-law believed. They somehow believed that the Jews were behind it, and that's not an uncommon point of view in Pakistan. But she knew that, um, she knew that, uh, like Muhammad Assad, who wrote *The Journey to Islam*, another convert. I'm sure uh, you know his work. Um, she, he had lost. He was a Jew from Austria who, who uh, converted to Islam, and he lost his whole family in the Holocaust. And she knew that even if she had converted to Islam, she would have ended up in the camps as well. So she had this understanding of what had happened during that period, and um, that is what radicalized her. So, and that informed her book, Islam versus Al-Kitab, I think. Unfortunately, I didn't read the book, but I'm, um, I would like to comment or to ask a question about the, the slide behind you. Uh, I was trying to follow up the, the sequence and then I found the person behind Jade, he looks familiar to me. So, uh, did he use this face on purpose or? Yeah, he's in, he, um, Mariam corresponded with Kutub. This ah. is uh, Kutub from the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And it was actually, he, when he was in prison at the time, this was before she left for Pakistan, and it was he that suggested to her that she get in touch with Mawlubi. Ah, okay. So he provided the introduction or through his sister who um, answered his letters for him. Okay, thank you. Yes, hello, thank you very much for the talk. I wanted to ask, um, usually we have this sort of, to me it's an imaginary conflict between Islam and the US or the West. Because there are so many Muslims living in the West. There are so many Muslims living in America. So is there actually a conflict between the Muslim Americans and the West? Or is it just, when we think about it geographically, you know, the Islam is somewhere and the US is somewhere, or the West is somewhere. That's my question. Well, um, I, I mean, I don't, I don't buy into this idea. I mean, the whole of there being this huge conflict between the West and Islam, I don't buy into it. But I do know that we've organized, I mean, a lot of our propaganda was organized around that idea that there is some existential difference between us and them, just the same way that there was an existential difference between, you know, liberal democracy and, you know, the Russians. I mean, to me it seemed like, how did we go so quickly from demonizing Russia and the Soviet Union to, you know, demonizing, you know, Islam? Um, I think people are more sophisticated about it now. But, um, and I do think you do have to make a distinction between Islamism and Islam. And, um, and it was really Islamism that scared me and that I did feel like under attack by. Uh, 